we go. One, two, three. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So, welcome to Behind the United Gallery. Today's guest is a well-known wet blade artist from North Dakota, Shane Balkovich. Very happy to have you on, the, on our podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Marcus. It's, it's an honor to be talking to you and actually um, hearing your voice and seeing your face. Yeah, it's really nice to finally see each other, right? So yes. it, would be, it would be better to be like in person something, but it's cool that we have this technology so we can uh, uh, chat together like and seeing us. This is, this is better than nothing. This is, I, this is definitely better than nothing. And uh, one of the things that I've learned over these years of, um, with my work and being you know, in social media and stuff is that I, I developed these friendships with these people and um online and i've never been let down when it comes time to actually meet them so any time that i i met someone online and then we became friends and then later on um we got to meet i've never been let down so um that, that's reassuring that it, it, we're real people on both sides of this it's just, just technology's given us the ability to uh find each other that we never would have known about each other any other way please tell us a little bit more about you um, I'm a non-photographer uh, that uh, found this process back in 2012, so I had never owned a camera, um, I'd never taken a class, never read a book on photography, and I fell down this rabbit hole called Wet Play Collodion, uh, the Wet Play Collodion process. And um, I started in my warehouse in the back of my business here, no windows, just in the corner, I uh, had a little sink. And um, the dark room was actually my studio as well. So I had no wall between my dark room and my studio. So when it was time to do anything in, in uh, safe light, my sitters had to go in the dark with me. So um, it, was, it was rather um, remarkable in that, in that fact is that um, I didn't have a separate dark room. So when I was creating um, my everyone, the, my whole back warehouse became one huge 5,000 square foot dark room. And um, I would yell, don't open the door and all these things. It was, um, it was rather crazy, but uh, here I sit nearly eight years later and um, I, I never had, um, I never had thought in a million years that someone would be interested in what I was doing in my back warehouse. Isn't that the best feeling? I, I know that somehow a little bit, but not in your way. Uh, and when I talk, when we talk about feelings uh, is, uh, I really like to shoot wet plates. So, uh, how would you describe what you feel when you create a portrait or a wet plate? Well, um, it's a romantic feeling. Um, and I knew this from the beginning, like I was chasing it. I've always been a history buff. I've always liked history, uh, Marcus. And, um, you know, I knew about the history of this process before I even started practicing it. And, um, you know, I was 44 years old and I never had a creative outlet at all in my life previously. And uh, here I was uh, chasing this, this crazy dream to make these portraits. And um, it was just for myself, you know, portraits of my family and stuff like that. So um, I feel like, um, I feel like I'm capturing history somehow. Like my work is um, giving a little window into what it's like to live here in North Dakota um, during my time that I'm here. Um, when I look back at the uh, work of like Orlando Scott Goff, who was a wet plate artist here in Bismarck back in the 1880s, um, there, there's something very nostalgic about it and um, something special that I just, I love that. And I've always, um, I, I feel like um, these, these plates, these long exposures, they're not, they're not like little snapshots of people. They're actually, they're actually 10 second movies of these people. So I see those, those are plates sitting on the shelf behind you. Um, you know, those, th those are uh, 10 second movies. If, mm -hmm. if your exposures, my exposures are usually 10 seconds of my studio. So those are, those are movies. The, there's heartbeats in there. There's a couple of breaths. There's a blink. Maybe, you know, what's really special about this, Marcus, is that there's a thought that maybe is, uh, that thought is being captured as well. And I like that idea. So when you come into my studio, there's hundreds of plates on the wall. And these are 10 second movies of each person that's ever walked into my studio. That's really nice. I never thought about it like that, but I'm capturing with strokes. So I have pretty powerful strokes and I can it's use uh, pretty instant. Yeah, it's not instant. You know, I do it a little bit different way. I 
don't turn up the strobe to full power. I just uh, wait two or three seconds and, uh, and then I use the strobe. So it's a mixture from both, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's an interesting approach. But I don't, I won't, you know, people have asked me in the past, uh, you know, why don't you get your exposure times down? And I have no, I have no need. Like I have no wants to get my exposure time down. People are so infatuated with, oh, let me get, you know, they're, they, you want to chase that instant exposure. I don't want any, I mean, I had, I did that wet play to my daughter um, this weekend. Um, and, uh, you know, she's six years old. It would have been very convenient to have an instant exposure, right? But <laughs> no, we, we had to talk and she said, dad, I can do this. And uh, she held for uh, nearly 11 seconds. Um, with that big gas mask on and you know what I mean she had her little doll there and stuff um, so I don't I don't this is the only process that I know Marcus so all the the bad things or the the negative aspects or the difficulties that people see in this process the long exposures you know having to have a dark room with you you know the expense of this process you know all the nuances that can come into this process all these natural things that are part of the process people look at that as as something that is difficult or not 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 in a positive way i don't know anything other than wet plates so these these are not hindrances to me this is just the only way that i know how to work so if you work within your the realm if you work within the boundaries of the process this isn't a hindrance 10 second exposure is not a hindrance it's all i know and that's all i care to know Super interesting to see it from that point because I came from another point. I was shooting digital and film and then web plate. So it's really interesting to uh, see your side. And it's really cool that you don't are like, maybe it's a strong word, like poisoned from, from other uh, processes, like from digital workflow. You just uh, went directly from nothing to uh, the web plate workflow. And so it was just plain normal for you. Yeah, and um, I didn't really even consider myself a photographer for probably four years. I wouldn't call myself a photographer. And, and it wasn't like I was, I was better than photographers. I didn't want to insult real photographers. I knew I would have, I, by that time, and, and now I have, I have photographers fly in from all over the country to spend the, uh, you know, a weekend in my studio with me. And I know what a real photographer what they've done and you know the things that they know and i never i never felt that way so i always it, it took me some years to even accept the the the, the title of a photographer because i didn't want to insult it i i felt myself more of like an image maker yeah but that changed right now when i see your images this is plain art for me and the cleanness of the plates too it's really great just great work that, that so, plate that I did of my my daughter was uh, plate three thousand five hundred and eleven. Wow! So I I, I num I've numbered every plate and dated every plate and signed every plate and labeled every plate with the title and the subject and everything and the person, every plate since day one. So that's three thousand five hundred and eleven plates I've made over the last seven years. That's a lot of plates. Yeah. So so. To, to, to answer your, you know, your, your, you praise my technique. Well, shit, I better be getting good, right? I've, been, <laughs> I've, had, I've had enough practice. So, you know, so I don't, I don't attribute my, um, you know, the cleanness of my plates to anything other than just making a lot of plates, figuring it out. So then uh, when you just talked about your daughter, I want to go to uh, about the plates you sent to the United Art Gallery. Uh, yeah. Could you please explain uh, how you came to the idea to create these plates? And uh, uh, did you have, have any challenges, uh, challenges to overcome to do these plates? I, you know, I, I'm in isolation. So it's been two months nearly. My, my studio has been closed. So I've canceled probably no, 20 Native American sitters coming in. And I haven't had anyone in my studio for two months. So but I, I refuse, Marcus, not to go down to my studio and create every week. So every Friday, I, I go down there, and um, I'm just using my family as my subjects now because that's the only sitters I have available to me. So um, this was a concept of, uh, you know, obviously, the, you know, in isolation, a gas mask, but I'm a photographer. And um, someone had brought to my attention that some other photographer over in Europe had done something similar with 
uh, put a, a put a bellows and a camera on his face, and um, I reached out to him right away and shared my my uh, rendition with him, and we became uh, we become really close now. And I've sent him some of my work, and, and and we talk almost weekly now. And it was just about this concept of this this camera over my face, and 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 he, this gentleman had done it before me um, when he had taken his picture. So I give him credit for the idea, and. Uh, but it was just my way of, um, of, of, of creating. I wanted to do a self-portrait. Um, my, my daughter, Abby, um, who also makes wet plates, she's 17 now. Um, she's been wet, wet, making wet plates for a couple of years. She actually took the, um, the lens cap off for me. Um, she's, how I do that is I have her sit there. There's a head brace behind me. And then I, ha I focus on her and I compose the shot she stands in for me and then we switch places and then um, I do all the work with the plate and then she just simply took off the lens cap for 10 seconds. So um, I wanted to take my shirt off, kind of um, make me feel a little bit more vulnerable. Um, my bowler hat is my, you know, is my trademark hat that um, for my studio, everyone identifies me with my bowler hat for some reason. And um, so that was important for me. And, and it was just a way for me to create a, an image that image was selected for World Wet Plate Day for their official poster as well. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Uh, I have seen the World Wet Plate Day and was taking part of it the last year, but this year I was so had so much to do with the gallery, so I had no chance to participate this year. But next year I'm gonna be there again. But it's super yeah. nice. I saw I saw the the flyer or the poster, how you call it. I saw it. It was it was nice. such it was such a huge honor that um, that they selected this image um, for that reason, but. Um, I think it's interesting ideas of photography, you know what I mean? Like this, this, this other gentleman um, had a similar, not the same pose, but he had a, a camera on his face and, and he had done that digitally, I want to say with his iPhone, I believe. And then, you know, me to come back with the wet plate. And I don't know if I'd ever seen his image. So it's weird how I came up with this, this concept. So, but you know, you, you're on Facebook and you're looking through so many images, you don't know what's registering in your head and what's not, you know what I mean? A lot of times. But I like to uh, any time that if I if I'm inspired by another artist's work, um, I always want to give credit to the people that inspired me. Do you know what I mean? I, I like that whole oh I'm inspired by this and let me do my own take. I I I I, I repeat that quite a bit in my work and and you don't, you know you just make it your own. Uh, there is a saying from a pretty famous photographer I met and he said that it's like not a big chance that the image you take nobody has took this image like that before, so. Uh, yeah, it's almost impossible, right? So let's move on to the next one. Of course, thanks. That pandemic thinker. Yeah. Um, another self-portrait. Here, even more so, uh, being vulnerable, being completely nude. This is my first. I'd never, if you would have asked me seven years ago if I would ever take a nude self-portrait, I would have said, well, you're, you're nuts. I mean, what, what would I do that for, right? But here I find myself um, in the middle of this pandemic um, you know, the, obviously the gas mask and, and you know, Rodin's uh, the statue or the sculpture that he did was my inspiration. I saw um, an original in, in Paris last year when I, I visited with my family. So, you know, again, there's the inspiration. You know, I wanted to, uh, to drape the cloth, uh, that, that drop cloth over the chair to make it look uh, kind of like a stone. I don't know if I've achieved that or not. You'd have to be able to tell me that. And I just wanted uh, to ask you what's what's underneath the cloth because I was thinking it's just a chair. Like... I, I was going for I was going for a, a stone like you know like I'm a statue and so I just kind of draped it tried to get you know get the feel of it it's kind of dark I left it dark you know and I could use a, a lighter you know um, a lighter cloth but that wouldn't have gave me this texture and I, I feel the shape that gives me um, you know this feeling that it's a stone I was chiseled out of uh, a piece of stone somehow to be honest I think if you would have taken a lighter cloth it wouldn't uh, the focus would not be as much at your face on your body than is it is right now and we really the hardest part of that whole shot um, obviously bes besides uh, um, you know me and the, uh, the lens cap my daughter once again that you know she turned her back while I took my clothes off and sat in that position she turned back around and then took the lens cap off and you know, that was kind of uh, a challenge, uh, you know, being um, nude in front of my daughter like that. Um, but the feet was something we were really challenged on is that I wanted to make sure that you could just see the feet like a little bit, you know, like in a lot of sculptures, 
the, you know, the sculpture's not complete. Like they'll finish the head and the, the bust and, and then, you know, it's not complete at the bottom a lot of times, how they just kind of let it go into the rock. Um, that was kind of my thought there. I don't know if I succeeded at that either. You did very well. I think it's so interesting to hear how many thoughts in such an image are uh, put in because uh, the preparation for a Redbird image is mostly the biggest part of the whole uh, image. I, to give your, the listeners an idea, I, I want to say that portrait took us about an hour. And that was, one, that was one take, by the way. That was it. Spent, what, 45 minutes up front, me figuring out, you know, and there was some logistical stuff, like I said, like, how am I going to get, you know what I mean? Like, you know, my, my daughter's 17, how am I going to get nude in front of my daughter and still keep this privacy and stuff like that? So there was technical aspects of that, too, that you normally would not have. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Very, very well done. That's the only thing I can say. It's, it's well, thank you. Uh, just because I'm looking to the left, maybe in the video, I have a second screen here and I look at the image, so I see it's uh, bigger and it gives me a stronger feeling of the image than a little icons on there. But it's, it, I think it's really great. Facing the, uh, the window there as well, and it, it was kind of, I wanted, to, you see the glare off the, off, the, uh, off the glasses of the goggles, that was, or the mask, that was really important for me as well. Um, something that I, I wanted to, I wanted that to kind of come out. I didn't want to, if I faced the other way or in another direction. So um, as far as light, I, that was one other thing that I wanted that, that mass fully illuminated, like eyeballs, you know what I mean? Like glossy eyeballs. I like this a lot. Go to the next one. Yeah, this is, this is not in the, I have to say to all the, the people that uh, uh, watch the video right now, That's not in the gallery because the gallery is limited to two uh, pictures, but uh, it's also a part of the series, right? Yes. So this is called, um, yeah, there's, there's probably nine plates so far that are part of this series that I, I call it the uh, Coronavirus COVID-19 Isolation Series. And um, this is uh, called uh, Girl with Virus. Um, are you familiar with Girl with Balloon by uh, Banksy, the artist that sp used spray paint on walls, the graffiti yeah. artist? You yeah, I remember now. No, sure, yeah, I know. Okay, so he, he, it, his work is that, you know, the girl in the dress and then the, the balloon is rising away, the red balloon is leaving him, leaving her. So this is, this is again, inspiration, Banksy. Um, loosely, again, you don't see as much inspiration. You see much more inspiration in the, the Rodin, um, the previous one, right, than, than you do this. But I, I still tip my hat to Banksy because I don't think, I, I, didn't, I didn't go and view the Banksy piece before I did this wet plate. But after I made the wet plate, it occurred to me that I was inspired by this, uh, the Banksy. His work, I didn't, I didn't view his work weeks before this. I, I never looked at it before I made this exposure. So I made this exposure and then after it was done, it occurred to me that I was inspired by Banksy, um, Girl with Balloon or Girl with Red Balloon, whatever it's called. So this is Girl with Virus. Um, my daughter, Olivia, who's nine years old. Again, the gas mask, it's a, it's a repeat kind of um, um, something that I started with my gas mask series six, seven years ago, the largest wet plate collodion collaboration of all time, 101 wet plate artists from around the world. Over six years, I sent gas masks out to them and we made 101 plates together. So it's the largest wet plate collaboration ever to undertake in, in the process. And so I had this gas mask around. It just seemed, it's funny how real life is playing out, you know, something that was in my life years ago. Do you know what I'm saying? Like how This, this pandemic and this virus, how this comes back, it's almost like haunting me. So my daughter, I asked her, um, this is a more involved image. Um, let's start with the, the ball, okay? That ball mm -hmm. there, a friend of mine, a photography friend of mine um, in Canada took a picture of this red ball and posted it on Facebook. And I saw the ball immediately and identified it immediately with the virus. So I messaged him. And I could have got the, a similar ball. It's just an exercise ball with knobs, right? I could have got one, a similar one at a local store, but it was important for me to ask him for his ball. I said, will you send me your ball from Canada to North to, to the United States? I have an idea for a wet plate to shoot. And he didn't hesitate at all. He said, sure, Shane, I'll send it out today. So he sent me this ball 
and it arrived. It's red in color, which you can't obviously tell in the wet plate. But I had my daughter, Olivia, the, the, the young lady that's in the, the portrait, I had her sit down. It took her about an hour with a paintbrush and acrylic paint, and she painted all those white tips on, the on, on this ball. I wanted to get that contrast. I wanted it to look more like the coronavirus. And um, we've all seen those pictures of what they, they perceive the coronavirus to look like. You know, obviously we don't have a picture of it, but we have a, a good idea what it looks like, its structure. So um, Olivia herself, and you know, again, a collaboration with me and my daughter, she sat down for about an hour and meticulously painted white dots on the tip of every, every knob on that ball. So she did that the day before. Um, and I explained to her that this was the virus. And then I told her to, uh, she said, well, what do you want me to wear, dad? And I said, I, you, I want you to wear your prettiest dress. And I don't want any, I don't want to know what dress you pick. You just pick it and you just come down to the studio tomorrow and that dress will be fine. And that's what she did. So she went into her, um, her, her closet, picked out that dress. She decided on the shoes. Um, I already had the gas mask for her and um, we set her up and I explained to her what I was going to do the, the uh, clock at her feet. Do you have any idea what that's there for? No, to be honest, I have no idea. Okay. Well, there's a, um, in order for a young nine-year-old girl to hold this still, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty sharp image. I think you would agree, right? For, for it was, I want to say it was a, a 10 or 11 second exposure. It's a pretty sharp image, right? But she has to stand and I don't know if you've ever tried to stand. One of the most difficult things for a, a sitter to ever do in the wet plate process is to do a standing portrait for a long exposure. It's just, I've had, I've had adults just crumble under the pressure. So in order to achieve this image, um, there had to be a head brace um, employed. And that head brace is hiding behind those little skinny legs of hers. So the, the armature coming from the base, there's a base, and then that armature go runs up her legs, and then it's actually holding her head into place, giving my daughter um, a, a crutch, something to rely on. But what I didn't like is that you can see she's so small and you know her feet are small. I had no way of covering up the base that was the um, the head brace. So there's a there's a tripod at the base, this three-pointed big piece of metal that is holding her in place. And um, I did not like that the, the composition of that black object uh, in relationship to her legs. So I simply just took a cloth, which is a technique I've used. And I, I think other wet plate artists back in the Victorian era also use the same. I, I'm not inventing anything here. Um, you just throw a cloth over the, the, the foot of your head brace and boom, it's gone. It, it worked out really great. <laughs> I never would have thought about that. But it's super, yeah. You know, she was standing there for probably a good 10 minutes um, in that head brace, which is not... It was not easy, but again, uh, my children, um, she was two years old when I started wet plating. Um, and my other daughter, um, Molly, is she, you know, that I took this wet plate this weekend of, uh, she's known wet plate her entire life. So they, they've been in my studio all the time. They know what I need. And, and look, look, look what a, a nine-year-old can do. She can perform. It's very important in these processes that I can do all the magic on my side of the camera. And I explain this to my sitters. And when the students come out from the colleges, I explain to them that I can be the most magnificent photographer on the other side of the camera, which I'm not, but I could be, but that doesn't matter anything if my sitter can't perform and do exactly what's needed of them. And so there's this dance between myself and the sitter that makes these image come to life. So that's, that's really important that it's not just all about me and what I can bring to the plate. It's also about what the sitter, um, what they can endure and what they can bring to the plate as well. And it's always a, a big part of both parties from the sitter, as you say, and from yourself, because you put a lot of yourself into the plate, uh, just from feeling the chemicals, the motion of pulling the plate and, and all you, you are doing and also the sitter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, with instant photography, you know, with digital photography, when I, when I take pictures with my phone, I just, it's my only other digital camera, by the way, Marcus, I don't have another digital camera. My only camera is on my phone. Um, I just don't get that feeling that I don't, I don't need that participation. Like I just, I don't need the participation usually. Um, I can just snap away. The sitter just does not have to be as involved as they do with these, some of these older 
older processes, these slower processes, these romantic processes. And but I'm I'm not here to talk about anything else other than what I know. And and when you talk to me, I'm gonna always talk about the merits of my process, not to knock anyone else's process. It's just this is what I do and you know and when I talk to a digital photographer and they tell me about what they're doing I want to hear what they're doing so uh, you know when people talk to me and ask me my opinion it's always I'm always biased towards wet plate but I don't, I don't have a choice about that I can understand that ah, great so let's jump to the next one this was actually the first plate for my pandemic series. So I had just, uh, we had just gone into isolation the week before. Um, I had to call off. I had eight people scheduled this day in my studio. So um, I, I, my studio time, I'm, before the pandemic, I was booked out eight months. And, and a lot of times I'm double booked, triple booked. But on this particular day, um, I had had to call off eight people from coming into my studio. My son, Grayson, I had not taken a wet play to him in, in four years, if you can believe that. So he's been very elusive to my camera. You know, he's a, he's a 15 year old boy now and a young man, I should say, you know, again, the, the repeating gas mask. I, I want these plates to remind us of why I'm taking them. And the gas mask is that token, right? I mean, it's the, the elephant in the room that says, well, what is this fucking all about? Right? Well, Obviously, it has to do with the pandemic, right? He shot this in 2020. The, the, you know, the coronavirus pandemic was sweeping the world. I mean, these, that's why I'm, I'm, I want these prop, this prop to be so prominent in my work um, because it's just, uh, I think it's important to, to know why I'm making this. I don't know if you've seen my um, Liberty Trudges Through Injustice. Have you ever seen, uh, seen that work of mine with Lady Liberty? Yeah, I've seen it in the video and I've seen it before okay. too. Okay, well, these pieces of wood are from that set. So uh -huh. there was a couple pieces of wood that were um, laying around, still around the outside of the studio, out in, out in the rocks. Um, and uh, so I found these two pieces of wood. I, I grabbed a screwdriver and uh, some long wood screws, and I made a crucifix, right? Uh, with, you know, just an hour before I took this exposure. So I made this crucifix out of this... Uh, this wood that had been in a very large collaboration. I mean, the other collaboration had 52 people and we worked on it for eight months. And, and so I really like the idea that, you know, that this, these two pieces of wood, which to anyone else, it's just two pieces of wood, right? But, but, but to me, they're special because that they were involved in this other image. So I, I screwed these two pieces of wood together and made a crucifix. I had like this head design thing that it's made out of actually uh, made out of chopsticks. So I had, I had the halo, which was that this, what I'm trying to achieve there is like a halo, that this is, this is a Christ-like or a, a deity or a God-like. If you're not a Catholic, it doesn't matter. He's some kind of God. The point of this is that um, nobody's impervious. Nobody's impervious. So if you do believe in Christ, you believe that, you know, I'm a Catholic, I'm, but I'm not a very, very religious person. But I, as an altar boy, as a young kid, I find these these religious overtones continue to arrive in my work um, unbeknownst to me. Like I don't, I don't really think about them as religious. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, I find myself creating in them and then people will say, well, there's, you know what I mean? Then they'll, they'll mention the religion. And then, and obviously I knew I was making a Christ figure, but I don't, I don't think of it in those, in those terms when I'm doing this. So the message here was nothing more than um, nobody is impervious. If, if Christ or whatever deity you want, whatever God that you believe in, you know, if you don't even believe in that, any immortal, um, if the immortals have got to wear masks and protect themselves, um, what's in it for us mortals? Yeah, it's a great message. It was hard uh, after you sent the, in the images to choose the two I wanted to, to publish, but now with the video podcast, we have the chance to show it more. So there's uh, one more image uh that has nothing to do uh, with the pandemic right now it's you with some eggs on the head it's called the anonymous uh, egging of an artist so let us hear about uh, what this is all about yeah so there's um there's some more self-reflection i think any time that a photographer takes a self-portrait and and if you look back at the history of photography um as i know you have and so have i 
I mean, photographers have been taking self-portraits for one reason or another for, for 180 years. Um, I think it's important to, we point our cameras all the time at other people, right? And, and if you take that uh, argument that I said earlier that you have to, you know, especially in my process, um, these longer exposures that the person has to be involved. I think it is a good thing to do is to um, point the camera at yourself sometimes and um, put yourself in, in their shoes. Um, I can relate to this also as an oncology nurse uh, by trade. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're on the oncology floor, you're taking care of patients and you're going in and you're starting IVs or you're giving them shots and, and you're causing pain. And, um, and, and this occurred to me years, long before I even found a camera, my friend, that I would um, let nursing students that would come to my floor in the middle of the night, I was a charge nurse on the oncology floor, and um, I, any time that I had a nursing student and I was doing some teaching or something with them, um, I would go out of my way to make sure that they got to start IVs on me uh, um, and that kind of thing and um, cause some pain to me. Um, because I, I think it was a good reminder for me um, to think about my patients when I caused pain to them, if that makes any sense. Yeah, just absolutely. Makes so sense. Um, it, it's good for um, anyone to, whatever craft it is, um, you know, if you're a painter, do a self-portrait, a, a painting self-portrait. So this is a self-portrait based off, uh, like you said, it's called an anonymous egging of an artist. And that's what it was. Um, I took this a week after um, my Lady Liberty piece in downtown Bismarck, my hometown where I was born and raised, was egged by vandals because of my work with the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. So um, there was boycotts and threats, uh, threats against myself, threats against my work. And um, the subsequent day after those threats, those threats came to fruition in um, the vandalism of Lady Liberty. And, and for these, these idiots to... Um, throw eggs at Lady Liberty of all things just it just kind of drove home to me um, how misguided these these people are uh, again this was another collaboration you don't see the collaborators here um, my one collaborator is my daughter Abby taking the lens cap off again but the other collaborators you don't see is my my daughter Malia which you um, my youngest who's six and then Olivia which you saw in um, Girl with Virus mm -hmm. they uh, said we're going down to the studio and you're gonna you're gonna crack eggs over my head and they looked at me like, what, dad, are you crazy? Are you crazy, dad? Why, why are you gonna, why are we gonna do this? And I, I, and my daughter, obviously, my oldest daughter, Abby knew why I was doing this, um, this anonymous egging of an artist, but the two younger ones, they didn't really understand. And I, I hope at some time they remember, you know, putting eggs on my head. And, and I mean, she, Olivia was completely in charge of the eggs. So that egg on the top of my head and on the top of my face and on my shoulder, she placed those there. We broke and I smeared egg whites all over and egg yolks all over my face. And then she, I held my hands out and my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter placed those eggs perfectly in my hands. So this is another, another collaboration. And it was um, a way of me reflecting, you know, um, some people found comedy in it. Um, and which I can see, like I'm like self-loathing or I'm, I don't know. Some people thought that this was a funny image, but for me, it was more of a serious image. You'll, you'll see that I left the one that, you know, lighting is always important. If I'm going to tell you my story, I, I need to show that. So you, you'll see that there's that very high contrast with the left and right, the illuminated and the non-illuminated face. Um, I wanted that darkness to be there. I wanted to, and that darkness kind of represented the darkness that was in the alley uh, the night that they egged my um, my work. So I, I wanted to kind of portray portray that. But you know, it was it was funny to me that some people um, found this was a piece of comedy for me. That this was my way of um, like making fun or something. And I I never really looked at it that way. It was more of just um, it was just telling the story that what how I felt about what happened. But what what it did is it gave me it was gave me a tool. This was a this was the tool that it gave me to fight back. And artists have this tool, and we can use this tool whenever we want. Great image, and I, I didn't see it as funny, but I just had to look at your facial expression, and, and for me at the second, there's no, there's no question about it, if it was a funny image or not. Perspective, right? It's perspective. People, it's funny that people, some people thought that this was just me joking around. Um, and I can, I can get that, but I don't, it wasn't my intent. My intent was to be, 
I was trying to do as serious as a portrait as I could um, with these eggs all over my face and in my hands. And, um, you know, I got my wet plate shirt on. That's the other thing, the stains on that shirt. Um, that was another, uh, you know, instead of like, you know, having my shirt off for this one, I left my shirt on because I, I think that tells the story. You as a wet plate artist, you you will recognize, most people won't understand the, the black stains on my shirt, right? But anyone who's a wet plate artist will quickly identify. And that's who I, I do this for a lot for myself. So I don't always do my work for myself. I, I do it for fellow artists. Um, you know, I'm always trying to think of other people as well when, when I create. And, and me leaving that, my, my dirty wet plate shirt on, my stained silver nitrate shirt on, um, was my way to kind of speak um, to my process and, and tip my hat to the process. Just to the viewers for, for a moment. First of all, we talked before about the red ball. So the wet plate process only sees blue light. That means everything that's red is going to be dark or black. And yes. And Shane is talking about the stains he has on his shirt. These are from the silver nitrate. Everything that uh, comes in touch with silver nitrate is not going to be instantly black. It's going to be black if you expose it to light. So if you have some stains on your hands or your shirt or somewhere else, it's going to be there forever until the skin regrows or until you put your shirt away. And uh, that's just a shirt from my point of view that shows how much work you did because there are a lot of stains you have there. And I have something similar like that. I have like, oh, what's the English word for it? I have to think. Uh, a pro, no, you know, apron? Apron is the right apron. word, right? Apron. Yes, apron, yeah. Uh, and I have that from my a grandfather that was uh, uh, repairing in this house, house shoes and it was all over dirty and maybe 40 years old and now it gets even more dirty from another guy in the house who's working from the wet plate process. So I have yes, this all the time on my, on my uh, body too. So I totally understand what you're doing there. My, my, my first wet plate shirt, I, had, um, I, I have a few of these over the last seven years, obviously. My first one was falling off me and, and breaking down and, and in really tough shape. And then the Historical Society of North Dakota mentioned, I was up there and they mentioned, well, we'd like to have your first shirt um, with your work at some point. So upon my death, I have my first shirt, my first wet plate shirt with all the stains on it is in a frame that's in my dark room and it'll stay with me until I die. And then in my will, um, that uh, that plate or that uh, that shirt, along with my bowler hat and my first camera, are going to go up to the Heritage Center um, with my work. So there's a little piece of me that is going to accompany a physical piece of me that's going to accompany um, my my plates that are up in the Historical Society. Um, I call these these stains on our hands. Um, you know, when we get uh, silver nitrate on our hands, I call that wet plate stigmata. Again, a religious term um for me it just seems uh uh it seems poignant that it's it's a ki kind of a badge of honor right i mean we don't like to get them but if we get silver nitrate on our hands it's not the end of the world and i've always referred to it as wet plate stigmata yeah uh, so uh did you people can imagine it's uh, a silver nitrate is even put uh in a very very small dose very very small uh, into children's eyes uh, after the birth, I heard. It's for some uh, kind of disinfection or something. It's really, really small. It was uh, used, we used to still, distill it at different concentrations, understand, um, because, uh, you know, strong silver nitrate can actually blind you. But it was for um, children born to women with gonorrhea. Um, they found out if the woman had gonorrhea and the child was born naturally with, uh, you know, birth, through the birth canal, um, the doctors, and this has been for decades and decades, um, the doctors would instill a concentration of silver nitrate in the baby's eyes to protect them from blindness. So it was a very, very effective. Um, but, you know, us wet plate artists, we think of, oh, we wouldn't want to splash silver nitrate in our eyes. No, but it, it, it actually has a, a, med it had a medical application. And I want to say that goes back to the Victorian era. Um, no, I just I wanted to point out it's not it's not dangerous to get it in the skin. It's just uh, no, you, you it's get not. a black just, skin. It just sits underneath the the, the dermis, and it's it, it's there. There's enough light gets to it to make it photosensitive. And like you said, if I spilled silver nitrate on my hands now, I would I could wipe it off and I wouldn't see those stains. It would be some hours later after the exposure um, to the light. But yeah, there it's absolutely benign that silver nitrate people freak out. They get Silver, I'll have my sitters will have a mark and they'll send me a picture of a stain or something that they picked up in the, in the dark room or something. And, and it's just, you're going to just, and they say, well, when does it come off? And I said, well, it, 
probably about two weeks or so. It just all depends. I said, in the meantime, um, it's just a, it's a badge of honor. It's uh, it's uh, it, it shows, it's like, you know, if you got paint spilled, you, you were in with Picasso and he spilled some of his paint on you. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, that's what it is. You know, when I do a workshop, the uh, participants get a, like a certificate. Yeah? And on the certificate, it says it's not valid if you don't have any stains on your hands. It's good. It's a good point. It's, it's just fun, but it makes sense too, right? Yeah, my daughter actually uses, um, she's a musician. So she's got a, um, a little stencil down in the studio. So she will put like a, a treble clef. Um, tape it to her leg and then she uses silver nitrate and with a q-tip and applies it to her skin she takes the the template off and she can she's created like little dis patterns on her skin using a oh. template that she came up with so it's kind of like a temporary tattoo yeah yeah it's interesting I never so she came up that. she came up with all on her own so yeah but because of the pandemic i wanted to ask you how uh, your life uh, was uh, affected from from the pandemic but you told us already a little bit about the shootings and how your neighborhood was affected from it well we um we're in the middle of north dakota so um north dakota is um about 30 miles from where i live my studio is the geographical center of north america is is in north dakota so we're that uh, right smack in the middle of you know Canada and America and um, so we're we're kind of isolated out here we don't have um, that many cases I want to say I think we've had 29 deaths so far in in my hometown but you know they're doing a lot of testing and um, stuff and we we've been in uh, we've been in lockdown now for uh, nearly two months and um, we're just getting by. I mean, we're just like everyone else where there's nothing special. Um, we just, we're finding ourselves at first. I think there was a lot of um, getting used to being around each other. I mean, the family, you know, we always had things to do. The kids always had sports or music or something to do. And we were always running here and there and we don't have that anymore. So, you know, I think the first couple of weeks it was a little trying because we were kind of all trying to figure out what we were going to do. But now I, I've got to be honest, Marcus, and I don't, I'm trying to find a, a silver lining in all this. I think we're going to look back at this time that we spent together in a, in a wonderful way um, that we, we got to spend time together in, 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 in ways that we probably, I'm teaching my daughter, Olivia, how to play chess. Um, you know, my, my daughter's spending more time with her paintings. Um, we all are spending a lot more time together and um, it's amazing. I just, it's just, I wouldn't give this time up for anything. I really wouldn't. But it's, you understand it's taken me some weeks to get to that. And, but I'm, I'm really trying to find a silver lining. And, and if I can find a silver lining, it's this time that we have together as a family, close knit. Um, and we're just cooking together. We're, we're doing everything together. And there's just is something that we just weren't doing in that. In, you know, in, in previously, we're just so busy doing everything we, we thought. We were doing everything that we thought was important. And now we find out none of that stuff was important at all. Like, I, if you strip, I could not agree more. I could not agree if you, more. If you strip everything away that you thought was essential, you thought it was essential, you really find out what's essential and what's not essential. And I would have to say about 90% of what we do is not essential to us living and, and being humans and, and still reacting and, and still being loved. Um, I just, I, I think. Um, And I, and I hope um, when this is all over that this continues to carry over, that people continue this feeling, that um, this feeling of closeness. And, you know, what I miss most is hugs. I miss, um, I get, I miss giving my, you know, obviously I can hug my family, um, but I miss hugs, friends, hugs of friends. I'm a very, I'm always giving hugs, high fives. And, and, and I, for me, um, as a human, And, you know, as an oncology nurse, I mean, touch was a very important factor as well. Um, hugs is the personal touch, the, the embrace. Giving someone an earnest hug is something that I very much look forward to uh, participating in again. Yeah, I could not agree more with that too. After shooting or if you, you have a shooting with somebody you know or with a model that really we had a great time together and created something not only friends, but also with these people. Normally I hug them afterwards, right? So that's, that's totally too normal for me. 
yeah, it's it's yeah. it's part of the it's part of the too. process. Yeah, the human touch, and I and I think if you watch the documentary, and I'd I'd really, um, you know, I'd really uh, be honored if your listeners do uh, take the time to watch the documentary. You'll see that uh, you see that hugging quite a bit in my <laughs> in in, yeah. in in the in the, in my work. So it's uh, it's important. Um, at the end of the day, why are we doing this? We're we're humans, right? We're humans, yeah. and and we we want to be human. And there's something humanistic about the web play process. There's something romantic, and I know. I'm down the rabbit hole and, and you're not going to convince me otherwise. And I'm, I'm a complete loss. I'm completely lost in this process and I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to be making wet plates and nothing else. If I had to stop making wet plates tomorrow, I would never create again. I honestly tell you that that's how strong I feel about this process. And, and I hope it um, somehow shows in my work. Yeah, to all the viewers, I will put down the link to the Vimeo uh, uh, video and also to Amazon Prime. Here in Austria, I couldn't get it on Amazon Prime, but I hope it's going to be available soon here. But I heard it's it's available in more and more uh, European countries, so it's going to be soon, I guess. But otherwise, I really recommend to watch the Vimeo video. I rented it and it was priceless, absolutely okay, and it was totally worth it. It was one hour of full pleasure to see you uh, working in your studio and working in your studio uh you give your studio away free for other artists it's always free so mm -hmm. um and i've had um i've had people do paintings in there photographers obviously that need a, a natural because remember north dakota you don't always you can't always go outside i mean in the middle of winter um, a lot of photographers can't create anymore because uh, they don't have their own studio or anything like that so um, I find that in the winter, I get a lot of artists taking me up. And, and when the students come out, and I have hundreds of students from the university come out every year to my studio, I always offer to the students, because usually they're artists, right? They're photographers or they're, they're in some kind of art class. And I always say, if you, need a, if you need a creative, safe place to create, just let me know. I'll just leave the door open for you. And I've never been, I've never been, um, I've never been disappointed. It's always just like, I leave the, it, it's, it's too nice of a space. I'm too fortunate, Marcus, not to share it. Like, you know, I'm in down there all day Fridays and I'm in there usually Saturdays and sometimes Sundays, but those other days, the door's just locked. And it, it, it's a shame that, that that resource is not made available. So they just, um, they just come in and I just leave the door open and they, there's only one rule, you, you leave it as you found it. And I've never had a problem with that. And um, I do. I don't care what you do. There's been videographers. They had a green screen in there last week. And yeah, I um, saw the, I, the video. I saw the picture. I would welcome. I, shit, I would welcome if someone wanted to play. If you wanted to get some friends together and play a game of poker. I mean, I don't. I, I think that the most, the more people I put in there, the the more feelings I'm going to have about the space. I, I, it's a living kind of space, and I want my studio to be like the epicenter for art in North Dakota. In order to do that. You have to share it, and th and that's my my real goal. I think that the energy from these people, even if they came in to play poker, <laughs> um, it, you know, the energy would be there, right? Um, because I I still have my old studio, which I practiced in for five years, which was nothing more than that that corner of my studio. I still have more romantic thoughts there than I do at my more, um, you know, my my more uh, my more recent studio. It's not about the it's not about the, the, you know, it's not about the building. It's not about all the, you know, the fanciness of it. it that, that doesn't mean I, I really, that's important, okay? You, you don't need to have, you know, a 2,100 square foot natural light studio to do wet plating. And that, that's what I, I, I try to let people know. I just happen to be fortunate enough to be able to pull that off. But I mean, um, that, it's not requirement. Look at the work that I did back in my stu in my corner warehouse with no windows. You don't need all this. You don't need all this extravagance sometimes. That's something. Sorry to interrupt, but it's something I wanna uh, show uh, all the viewers with the gallery too. I just put uh, on today two images of a family uh, that uh, have a kid at home and they they stage their uh, vacations at home, like they're in Venice and stuff. And they just do it with an iPhone, right? And the images are great. You know, they, they, that's the same thing like shooting a wet plate. I know, I'm sure they, they took like one hour to set everything up to take this one picture. And everybody can do that at home. 
you don't it need doesn't like matter. an expensive camera yeah absolutely you don't you don't you can do you the, i always i've always thought marcus the less you have to create with that translates to a better image sometimes do you know what i mean like you could have a twelve thousand dollar camera and and these light fixtures and you could have you know what i mean you could have the best of the best and then someone will come along with a pinhole camera with no lens and they will show you how it's really done so i mean i always use the pinhole camera idea and i've made done pinhole uh, photography too just dabbling and i've always to me that always proves that point because i've seen some i have seen some pinhole images to just die for right and they got nothing they're using a paint can probably with you know what i mean with a hole in the front i mean it's it doesn't you don't need it we have it in the gallery too a guy did a pinhole self-portrait <laughs> look at it and be inspired yeah be inspired you don't you don't don't get caught up in that don't get caught up in that don't, less is more and Absolutely. um here's here's what i always tell the students is that does the spinal image speak to you if the final image speaks to you and you like the final image nothing else matters nothing nobody goes back and looks at an ansel adams and wonders what lens ansel adams would use i happen to know that he had a carl zeiss tessar lens in his repertoire which i also use but nobody cares about the lens or what f-stop or anything or what even kind of photographic process he was using do they it's like uh, i like this it's not from me and it's said uh, very often before but it's like if you go to a chef and uh, tell him what kind of uh, pots you have you know your food is so good you know it's stupid it, it's 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 blind it, it's not it's not it's not the truth so it doesn't matter let him do let him go into his kitchen and make you the best don't even tell him what you want to eat that's you know that there's the other thing too okay because i think in this day and age of all the you know um instant photographs and all the people walking around with digital cameras there you know what i mean don't even tell them what you want to eat you go back in the back room you do something for me because i respect you as a chef or as an artist or as a photographer it doesn't matter or as a sculptor if we go back to rodin it doesn't matter right you do what you do and show me what you got and that's at the end of the day that's all we have and we can either like it or we or we can't or we don't and, and if you don't like it just move on there was a post today on facebook about um that a lot of the wet plate photographs are a lot of the same and they were kind of putting down a little bit of the portrait work and that there's nothing really good coming out of wet plating that it's just a bunch of stagnant images um but i think you can say that for any photographic process right i mean it's not it's that's not it you just got to find what you like and just chase that and be inspired by things in your life um don't 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 get caught up in oh i don't like that and well so you so what if you don't like that image if you don't like my image guess what marcus if you don't like one of my images go make your own yeah you know watch I mean? some, some other images it's it's totally fine it's totally fine i mean i don't expect everyone to like my work and all people don't like all not all people like my work that's that's perfectly okay but what i don't like is what we've really gotten into and um i, I know i'm getting long-winded but i was on a i was on a um a, a photography group this weekend and this gentleman took a digital photograph of this woman um and it was absolutely gorgeous the light the mood everything about this photograph was absolutely gorgeous to me okay um not that my 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 opinion matters that much but to me it was gorgeous and he asked for feedback like he wanted people to critique or to like well, how can i change this and i felt like and i was looking at all these comments and all these people that were commenting none of those people could do an image as good as that image but they had an opinion about that image and i told i messaged the photographer i said do me a favor or do yourself a favor don't just keep doing what you're doing keep creating and try to improve on your own take what you can but don't take someone else's advice you don't want to be like them you have a unique voice this is a good image if you can do more images like this i think you're doing something that's special that's what i wanted to relate to this young kid and i said don't 
if you, you're going to get caught up in taking everyone's advice. And trust me, 99% of the people that throw advice online, they don't know how to do it themselves, but they sure will give you advice and they're going to steer you off the path that you've been found, you find yourself on. A lot of specialists out there lately in the internet who read something and know a lot about it without trying. But yeah, that's another topic. <laughs> I get it. I get advice all the time about wet plating from people that have never made a wet plate. It's it's hilarious. They'll they'll correct me or they'll they'll say this or that, and I'm like, Are you, how many wet plates have you made? How many wet plates have you made? And the, and the, the, it's always it's quiet. It's always quiet. So make a wet plate. Then you tell me. Then you come back to me and tell me your opinion or give me some advice because right now I'm too busy being inspired by other people that support me and finding other artists and further fellow wet plate brothers and sisters and trying to support them and what they're trying to do. We're all on different paths. We're all at different levels, right? We're all at different skill levels. Obviously we all have different tastes. So if you don't like something, move on. If you do like something, let the artist know what more can you ask for? Yeah, absolutely. So my last question for today is, do you have a question you want to ask yourself? I have a question that I, I want to ask myself. Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um, I'd like to know, I don't, in the seven or nearly eight years that I've been doing this, I don't know how I, I got on this path. And I, the question I'd like to go is where this is taking me. Like, I, I feel like I'm putting one step in front of the next. You know what I mean? I'm creating and I feel like I'm, I'm just finally now getting my footing eight years in, I'm, I'm finally starting to, maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting my footing a little bit. Maybe I'm understanding a little bit who I am as a, as an artist. Um, I would like to just know, um, what's at the end when I'm done, when I lay the camera down and I don't, I make that last plate, no matter how many numbers and no matter how many plates it is, when I make that last plate, what, what does it all mean? What, why did I do this? Why do I, why do you feel compelled um almost like breathing to me marcus and i don't mean i'm i'm a hopeless romantic but i really i i, I feel my entire um persona my entire well-being come down if i'm not able to create so why, why are you doing this that's, that's why I'd, well, that, that's what i'd ask myself and and maybe you know what maybe this isn't a question for myself maybe this is for someone to answer after i'm gone but it's a question uh, everybody uh, could ask uh, themselves why they are doing what they do. It's, it's something you should think about and, and uh, uh, get inspired maybe by others who, who do stuff. I'm not sure. There's a, there's, I think there's a lot of answers or not answers to this question. Yeah, I, and I, don't, I, I certainly do not have the answer to that question, sir. I certainly do. <laughs> and, 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 that, and, and to be honest with you, guess what? That's reassuring at the end of the day, right? I don't want to have all the answers. I don't want to make the perfect wet plate. I never want to find perfection. It, it, it's impossible. Yeah, I could not know. I, I could not agree more again. Uh, so Shane, it was really nice talking to you. I have to uh, I put all your links down below. So people just, oh, <laughs> just uh, uh, get the links to Shane's work, to the Amazon Prime video. Watch the video, guys. Watch the video. It's really cool to the Vimeo video and uh, I enjoyed talking with you a lot today. It's got a, it took us a little bit longer, 10, 10 minutes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, Marcus, let's just do this. Uh, let's do this favor next time. Let's just, uh, let's just not make it this a, a one-time thing and we can, um, we can share, um, you, you know, we can share our journeys together um, okay. again and again in the future. So it, it's an honor. The fact that you think that what I have to say means anything, that's, that's very important to me. And, and um, I will, um, if there's anything you need from me, you got to let me know, okay? No, it's, it's perfectly fine. Thanks for your time. I was honored that you'd be on our first podcast, so to say, video podcast. And uh, the only thing I have to say to the viewers now, share our gallery. Watch it every day. It's going to be one or two or three images new every day. Uh, so I got already a lot of new images, a lot of wet plates, a lot of film, a lot of prints. It's amazing what people do. Thanks again, Shane. And yeah, see you in the next one. Bye, guys. It was nice, to, nice to talk to you, my brother. Take care.